I was in my bedroom, um, not sleeping, and I saw him. I had a, an open eye vision of, of the Jewish Jesus. I mean, he looked very Jewish to me. I've heard the word Jesus and Christ, and, but thought, no, I'm not, I'm not supposed to look into it. I'm Jewish. And I remember saying out loud, you know, God, if, if this Jesus is real, show me. But you know, the God in his brilliant uh, way of doing things appeared to me in a way that I would not find threatening. So he appeared with a, with a talit, with a uh, prayer shawl and those traditional sandals that we read about. And I remember he opened his arms like that and I could see the, the talit, the prayer shawl going in. And he had said, come to me. And his eyes were just love. A remarkable phenomenon. Six million Muslims are converting to Christianity each year. Well, one reason it's happening is that people are rebelling. Muslims are rebelling against radical Islam. Uh, one pastor in Egypt apparently said that the Islamist, the Muslim Brotherhood President Muhammad Morsi was, quote, the great evangelist. Why? Because the extremism of his policies told a lot of Muslims, wow, this guy's crazy. You know, I don't want to be part of any religion that he's part of. The reason a substantial number of them convert is that they have dreams and visions of Jesus Christ. An Iranian convert said, quote, many people are having dreams and visions about a shining man dressed in white telling them about Jesus. God has commanded me in a dream to go to the big church on the market square and ask for the imam, meaning the priest, to tell me the truth. He goes, quote, dreams. Christ appeared to them in their sleep. Christ is a prophet in Islam. He's called Isa. But interestingly, in these dreams, these Muslims are getting the clear idea that it's not Isa, uh, that it's in fact the Christian Christ that they need to be following and following through the mechanism of the Christian Bible and the Christian church. This is uh, Dr. John Coven. I was on staff at the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry during uh, those years that there was a revival called the Pensacola Revival. And I want to recount this story that was just an extraordinary event that happened that year as I took a team with me to India, precious people, a precious place. Around the year 1999, I believe, or 2000, around that time, it's been quite a few years, and a, a really miraculous thing happened as God showed his love and his care and also his authority uh, during this trip. I took with me about 15 or so students at that time and we traveled to India to do some ministry in South India with one of the uh, friendly ministries there and, and pastors, a father and son team actually, that were working in South India. And it was Tamil speaking India area and we were ministering both on the mainland and we ended up crossing a, a rather very highly trafficked bridge to an island called Ramasharam, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, which was a, a primary place for pilgrimage and a location of a very, very large temple. Uh, I don't know how many stories high. I'm going to say at least 10, if not more stories high. And with many idols going up, it was pyramid shaped. And it was a, a location for pilgrimage in that southern area. And traffic and buses and people crossed that bridge and just inhabited that island. And there was a a, uh, a new work there with a, a pastor at that time he was living in a compound and looking to bring the christian message well we traveled there and uh, the son of that pastor one day gave us a tour he said let me take you down to the beach area and we went down to the beach and there was many many people giving out pamphlets tens of thousands uh people involved with the hindu religion there were doing homage along the uh, beach there and and with local people that were represented there uh, doing some ritual exercise there with them and also they were going into the sea to wash away their sins across from that beach there was a, a low-rise factory-like building which we were taken into by our guide and there were many chairs almost like barber chairs they were and there were little children on them and they were getting their hair shaved off many of them crying and their hair was being put into a furnace i was told as an offering to the spirit gods of the idols of the area and uh we were pretty much awed by all of this and and of course we were you know representing the God of the Bible and uh, the God we understand created heaven and earth and uh, who sent Jesus Christ. So I uh, looked at all this and we experienced all this on a bright sunny day and I didn't know what to say because I wanted to share the message of the God who created everything, heaven and earth and, and the story of you know the, re the fall of man and, and how many other spirit uh, were introduced to mankind to be worshipped and idols created but it was impossible and there were so many people and and we were foreigners and 
So I prayed in my heart and I decided to do one thing. I, we walked out onto the beach area, we made a circle, and we just prayed that the God above all gods who created heaven and earth, who uh, sent Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago and, and, and sent him to pay for sins and oppression and to raise him from the dead, that that God above all gods would somehow manifest himself and show himself to these people. And, uh, and I, we just cried out on that beach for that to happen and that there would be some kind of demonstration even to the high priest and the priests of, of that large temple that was there on the island of Ramashram. So we did that. We went back. We crossed over again. We did some outreaches in the mainland. And then we turned to America. About a month later, I got an email that totally shocked me. The uh, people that were there, part of the ministry of the Christian ministry in that compound, sent me a letter saying this, that about four weeks later, maybe three weeks later, if I'm remembering properly, that the high priest who was there 22 years and who was very anti-Christian and he had even persecuted them, uh, was in his room way up at the top of the temple and Jesus Christ had alive and himself the Son of God walked in and stretched out his hands and appeared to this high priest who had long hair and his hair was dedicated to the spirits and the demons of the area, as I was told, alleged to me. So anyway, uh, Jesus Christ talked to him as he told the story later and said, you have been deceiving the people all these years. I am the one true God and I'm above all others. And that high priest immediately repented and, uh, and just and just you know, started gathering his idols to get rid of them. And that same visitation, Jesus said to him, as he extended one of his hands and said, said look at and, and extended a photo and said, go visit this woman in this photo, which was in his hand. And the photo was the, the wife of the pastor that lived in that compound. Well, the high priest shaved off his hair, which had been dedicated to the spirits, collected all of his idols that he had in that upper chamber, went downstairs and started smashing them. The younger priest said, what are you doing? He said, I've been deceiving you all these years. Jesus Christ is the only true God and above all other gods. And then he began a campaign to take down the other uh, idol statues that were set up around the perimeter of the island. He also got a small team after he had shaved his hair and went to this compound where this pastor, his wife, and a small group lived, a small staff, and showed up at the gate and said, I wanted to speak to the woman of this of this uh, place because they knew who they were, though this high priest did, they showed up with trepidation, wondering whether this was going to be some kind of persecution. But the high priest said, I, Jesus Christ appeared to me, told the story, and, and showed me your picture. And he said, what must I do to follow this Jesus Christ and to be saved? So he went on to start a movement for a short time. It lasted, I think, a few months. And then I don't know what happened after that or what have ever become of this high priest and this man. But this visitation of Jesus Christ in response to our prayers on that beach is a true story and a true email that I received. And it was a significant movement on the island of Ramashram and a miracle that showed God's love for his people and that he is the one true God who loves India and India's people. God bless you and may this encourage you and may this draw you closer to the love of God that was shown to us and the freedom that comes in Jesus Christ. This is why we do the updates. This is why we end with the gospel. This is why we share the simple ABCs of salvation, which is just a childlike, simple explanation of salvation. What's the gospel? The gospel means good news. The Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians in chapter 15, the first four verses, says the gospel is that Jesus came and he died. He was crucified for you in your place, by the way. He was buried in your place, by the way. And he rose again and defeated death on the third day in your place, by the way. And he's coming back again one day to take you to his place, by the way. That's the good news. That's the gospel. What are the ABCs? Very simply, the A is for admit or acknowledge that you're a sinner, that you need the Savior. Romans 3.10 says, there is no one righteous, not even one. You might think you're a good person, and you may be a good person, but you can never be good enough. And Romans 3.23 tells us why. It's because all have sinned 
and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 is interesting because it announces, for lack of a better way of saying it, the bad news first, and then offers the good news. What's the bad news? Well, the bad news is, is that the wages of sin is death. In a sense, you've been sentenced to death. You have the death penalty because of sin. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, you'll forgive the simplicity with which I illustrate this again, but it is childlike simple. What's a gift? Something that's given. Something I don't pay for. Someone had to pay for it. See, if I pay for it, it's no longer a gift, it's a purchase. Oh, it's a gift that is given to me, if I would but receive it. But He paid for it. We are not our own, but purchased with a price. It cost Him everything, His life, His blood shed in our stead, to purchase us and for us this gift He offers to us of eternal life. That's the good news. The B is for believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. I emphasize that for a reason. It's not you might, you could, you should, it's a good chance, the jury's out, we'll see, verdict's not in. No. You will. Why is it so definite? Why is there no still jury deliberating on it? Why is the verdict in? Because Jesus said, it is finished, period. Not comma. I'm not angry. Maybe I am a little bit. It's not, it is finished if. It is finished, but, or this one, <laughs> emphasis added, it is finished, however. Oh, that's got riddled with legalism. The implication being there's something I still need to do. No, I don't have to do anything. He did it all. He paid it all. It is finished. Chalas in Arabic. I love that word because you spit on people when you speak. <laughs> It, it, actually, in the original language of the Aramaic and Hebrew and my native tongue of Arabic, it's not three words, it is finished. It's just one word. It's much more convenient. And I love the power of that word. Chalas! <laughs> Period. That's, it's done. Finito. I'm going to leave that one right there and move on. The C. <laughs> you know, probably as good of a time as any to apologize sincerely. I know that people uh, tell me to t tone my humor down. <laughs> I'm, if you only knew, I, I, I try, I already do. So what, <laughs> that's toned down. So I don't know what, so just pray for me, I guess. But I, I love to laugh. It's so medicinal. And, and plus, God has a sense of humor, doesn't He? <laughs> if you doubt that, just look at yourself in the mirror and you'll realize. <laughs> okay, all right. Come back. The C is for call upon the name of the Lord. Or as Romans 10, 9 and 10 also says, confess with your mouth. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And lastly, Romans 10, 13 says that all who call upon the name of the Lord, and here's that word again, will be saved. We